Good morning, Stan Stahl here with Secure the Village. It's our February Information Security Management webinar. And um, this week we're gonna, or this month, this week, ha, huh? this month we're gonna be talking about uh, small business cyber readiness with Craig Moss of the Cyber Readiness Institute. Uh, we're, um, let me click that. We are Secure the Village. Uh, we we just we see ourselves as a community based response to the cyber crime and privacy crisis. Craig and I were talking earlier about silos, and we'll talk more about that over the next hour. But uh, cybersecurity is not a silo. It's 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 takes everybody. It takes the village to secure the village, and our whole objective is to turn people into cyber guardians, organizations into cyber guardians, all the way from the boardroom to the to the living room. Um, and I just have to call out, I'm grateful to uh, my company, Miller Kaplan, for their very, very generous support to secure the village, to, to help us grow, to help us become uh, an international organization, as it were. Uh, so uh, with that, we are, as I said, this is our, our monthly management webinar. It's the second Thursday of every month from 10 to 11 in, in the morning. This month, we've got Craig Moss, uh, of the Cyber Readiness Institute. He's the director of content and tools. And um, as you can see, Craig wears a lot of other hats as well. We're gonna just turn it over to Craig now. And uh, as we're moving along, if you've got any questions or whatever, just put them in the chat box and Craig and I will try to, try to get to these. Uh, Craig, good morning and thank you and welcome. Thanks very much, Stan. It's great to be here. Pleasure to, to see you again. and and get a chance to talk to the, uh, the group that you've pulled together. So let me do a screen share here and go to this mode. How's that look, Stan? There you go, it looks great to me. Okay, mm -hmm. so what we're gonna talk about is helping small businesses become more cyber ready. And whether you're one of the small businesses or you're somebody that is works with small businesses, um, we think this will be valuable for you um, as we kind of work through this. So what do we do at the Cyber Readiness Institute? We're a not-for-profit and we help to convene senior leaders, both of large companies and then also companies in their value chains. And then also groups like Stands and Secure the Village. Um, <clears throat> the reason that I highlighted demyst demystify the most is that was our intent from the start is how do you demystify cybersecurity for non-technical people? And uh, it's gotta be one of the, the fields that has the most acronyms, that it creates the most new acronyms on a routine basis. And we wanna help people figure out what is really relevant to their business and what can they do in a practical way. What we do that is all available to you is we develop free content. And it's all free. It's not a freemium model. We're not trying to sell you something later. It is free content. And we have a cyber readiness program, which is basically an e-learning um, course that you could go through with different resources to help you become a cyber leader in your organization or to use it with your clients. And it has like training materials, sample policies, a host of things like that to really help you create a foundation for cyber readiness. Yeah, we find so, that, Craig, so very, very valuable, uh, your, your resources. Uh, many of them are on the Secure the Village uh, library as well. And like your ransomware playbook uh, is, is really well done. And I, I view it, I, I just find it uh, so valuable in for us to help our clients uh, better understand kind of how to navigate through a ransomware. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer. Yeah, thanks very much. And it's funny, the ransomware playbook, <clears throat> um, the approach I came up with was to do a decision tree. And because if you really think about it, you know, it, you there's the whole preparation stage. And when you actually have a ransomware incident, how you have to respond has all to do with how well you're prepared. And if you haven't prepared, it turns into like a chaos situation. If you're well prepared with tested backups, um, it's really not that big of an issue. I mean, it's a pain in the neck, but it's not a devastating issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was kind of an interesting thing. And, and to kind of think through 
the practical application for a small company on that and to try to map it out for them. You know, what are the things you do? And, and it kind of shows how quickly you get to recover and get back, get back up and running if you've done the preparation. And if not, it takes you down this whole like, like maze of different situations and whether or not you have insurance and, and things like that. Yeah, now, I've seen studies uh, that that preparation is good, cuts at least a third off the cost of recovery, uh, which is then money spent on the preparation is money well spent. Yeah, you know, but if you look at other, all different types of compliance issues or even human behavior with health, um, people tend to be reactive and they tend to um, put more controls in place after an incident. So, you know, after you have a fire in your house, then you get really serious about fire prevention in your house. Um, after people have a, a heart attack, unfortunately, that's when they might start to get more serious about diet and exercise. So we see that to an extreme with cybersecurity, um, yeah. to an absolute extreme degree, that kind of behavior. So the reason that we can give all these things and make them available to you for free is that we're funded by these organizations. Um, and not only do we get funding from these organizations, but we also get a lot of practical advice and expertise. So we have a, a uh, expert group. So we have people from MasterCard and, and IT and cyber people from uh, uh, Microsoft, ExxonMobil, GM, Principal, all working together with us to try to demystify cybersecurity for small mid-sized businesses because they all have small mid-sized businesses in their value chains. Yeah. So are you saying here then, Craig, that it, uh, dare I say this, it takes a village to secure the village? I like that. I like that. Yeah. I love the name of your organization. I think that's great. And it, it very much is true. And I think that the solar wind situation has really um, exaggerated uh, or exemplified how important supply chain is. Yeah. <clears throat> so why cyber readiness matters to small mid-sized businesses. And Stan and I, as we go through this is, we wanna hear from you with any questions that you have, put them into the chat. And we're gonna go, we don't have a lot of slides. We're gonna kind of go into a discussion format. I like to start off with this slide. Um, this is from the New, York Mag New Yorker magazine. Came out, I think last March, <clears throat> right around the time the pandemic really hit. And what we have seen since then is that the increase in cyber crime has been astronomical. And they're targeting more and more small mid-sized businesses. And so those are some of the things that you really need to think about. A lot of small mid-sized businesses think, hey, I don't really have anything that somebody else would want. Why would the criminals come to me when they could go to a large company or try to attack a bank or or <clears throat> something like that. The answer is that you also can be a gateway to another company. So they might not be coming to you to access your data. They might be coming to go through you to get to another organization and you would just be collateral damage. Yeah, we see that. So it just when you just read the press um, and like, you know, we have our cybersecurity newsletter that comes out weekly. So it, it covers the, the cybersecurity news and regularly, uh, and just reflecting back to the target breach from several years ago, again, they got hit through their supply chain. Uh, we have several clients that their customers of our clients are very concerned about that supply chain. So they are pushing requirements down onto their customers, their, their vendors, I'm sorry. Uh, and of course the entire uh, CMMC program in the Department of Defense does that same, has that same flavor of pushing things down to the supply chain. Absolutely. And, and you know, some of the work we're doing with, uh, with General Motors has been really looking at the small mid-sized companies in their supply chain, mm -hmm. not just on the supply side, but also their dealer network. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the dealers are all connected um, through the uh, 
different types of systems to get into GM. And so that would be another opportunity for hackers to go through dealers to try to get to, to GM. Mm -hmm. so it's really important to think about how you're interconnected to other organizations. We did some work last year. <clears throat> we were looking at the cybersecurity of uh, law firms, for example. Now, law firms, if you think about it, have a lot of highly, highly confidential information. It could be on cases. It could be on upcoming mergers and acquisitions hugely valuable information, that would be another type of target that people don't often think about um, or accounting firms, things like that. Mm -hmm. So at CRI, and Stan and I have talked about this before, he's part of our um, small business advisory council. Um, and we really think about human behavior. So if you, if you broadly think about cybersecurity as being people, process, and technology, at CRI, we are most concerned with the people and process side. Um, of course, you do need technology, but ultimately you need the right human behavior and you need to try to develop a culture of cybersecurity or cyber readiness inside your organization. Yeah, that, that is so absolutely vital. And the people in the audience, the attendees and, and others, you might watch this. If you look at the Secure the Village website in the library, we've got several videos just entirely focused on, on the cultural aspects of things. Because Craig, what you're saying is uh, we find it so absolutely right on. Uh, the tone is set at the top. Uh, in that critical role that leadership has. Um, and it's got to flow all the way down through the organization into and including the IT department or the IT vendors if they're uh, if, if they're a third party. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that at CRI that we do and with our cyber readiness program is that we have each organization appoint a cyber leader inside that organization. And we provide training to that person on how they can be effective. And Stan, we find that the best cyber leaders don't even have to have an IT background. You need somebody in the organization that's able to effectively communicate with others, mm -hmm. that has the respect and trust of other people in the organization and can really help to bring the idea of cybersecurity up uh, in, on the, onto the radar of the organization. Yeah. To one extent, do you see that there's still that myth that oh, information security, that's an IT problem, or our IT people have that taken care of, or we don't have to pay attention, IT's got it, that sort of mythology. Yeah, no, we, we say that. Unfortunately, it's still really common. And, and it's also complicated by the fact with a lot of smaller companies, they don't have an in-house IT person or staff. So they're actually outsourcing the IT to either a, like some type of IT consultant, or a managed service provider or some kind of external party. And that even in many cases makes it worse because mm -hmm. they then think that, that they are really outsourcing cybersecurity to that third party or to that outside group. And that is a complete fallacy. Yeah. Because again, if you get stand back to the human behavior side, you, uh, your organ, you're responsible for the human behavior in your organization. You can't outsource that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's well said, uh, ab absolutely, that you can outsource the technical management, right. but you can't outsource leadership. Leadership's got to start up at the top. And it's, again, to, to use the phrase again, that tone at the top, uh, it's how do, you, how do you effectuate a change in behavior? I mean, I want it in, you know, so that when that employee, wherever he or she may happen to be, gets an email that, you know, hey, click your password's about to change, click here to change your password, or you right. just won a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, or da 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 da. Right. I want the hair on the back of their neck to stand up, you know, <laughs> like this is dangerous. Watch out, be careful. And that's leadership. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the other thing that we think about often is you need to make it practical. So I go into a lot of organizations around the world and they have what I, what I call a workaround culture. 
So they've, they've put some policies in place and they put some technology in place. But if you actually look at how people operate to do their job, a lot of people don't follow the policies because they're trying to do their job and the policies are actually intrusive. Okay. So one quick example, I was working with a mid-sized manufacturer um, and they had a no USB policy. You're never, never supposed to use USBs or thumb drives. And we were talking to them and I was talking to these uh, sales engineers and I noticed that they all had USBs. And I said, you guys use USBs a lot. And they said, all the time, our clients give us drawings and specs on USBs. And I said, well, you know, you have a policy against using them. And they said, yeah, we kind of know that, but, but you know, we're not gonna tell a client, we're not gonna take the, the drawings back to, to put together a bid. So there's a case where the IT department had pushed out a policy that was completely impractical. And what we did in that case is we went to IT, brought in the sales engineers and said, okay, what is a workable solution? And it turned out that they set up a non-network computer. So the engineers could bring back the USBs from the clients and they would go into a non-network computer where IT would pull the stuff off, make sure it was clean, et cetera. So there it became a practical way, whereas before the policy was just impractical and it was a workaround culture. Mm -hmm. And what happens in a workaround culture in that case is the people in accounting see the people in sales using USBs. And then I'm going home on the weekend to do some work. And I think I'm just going to pop it on a USB to take it home with me because I see them using it. So there's a case of workaround culture. <clears throat> and that's something that all of you really need to be aware of is how do you get, it's much better to have everybody following four policies than nobody following 30 policies. Yeah, that, you know, and, and, and what you say is both true from a security perspective, but it's also true from a, a, a human motivational behavioral perspective, if, if you will. Uh, I mean, I have seen with several situations uh, people working at home on a secure VPN back to headquarters and they need to print something, but the printer, of course, that their VPN connection allows them to print to is the printer in the office. Right. And they need to print it here at home because that's where they're working. So right. they will email it to themselves. And now it's on this insecure machine, right. uh, which they then print off of. Uh, we had a situation, goes back several years, where a person did that in, in the company. Uh, the file that she ended up sending to herself got compromised because her work her her home computer was not secure uh, that surfaced on the dark web and one thing led to another it was a, only a w2 file of 2000 employers so you know a little bit of sensitive information there i think you know right, right. kind of thing uh, right. that led to a whole first breach disclosure then an ftc investigation because now personal information had been lost uh, by the time they were finished, they were well into several six figures in cost. Yeah, no, it, it's really, a, it's, it's a daunting situation. And that's why the behavioral part is so critical because the, the person that in the story you just gave was not, they didn't have bad intent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they just didn't had kind of sloppy behavior. Yeah. So, and then as I mentioned before, we have a small business advisory council that Stan is part of. Um, and we generate content from that also. And maybe Stan, I'll stop sharing for a minute and pass it over to you. You can show the group uh, the thing that we just released together. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, let me start sharing now back to this. Um, so now, let's see, I've lost my screen. Can you, can you see that, Craig? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, I can't because I, there we go. Now you should see it. We do. Uh, so th this is in, uh, just came out. Uh, January 29th is the dateline, uh, 2021. Yeah, this Small Business Advisory Council, Craig, that you you guys have set up, I, I just find it so, so very valuable. This is a piece we put together. Uh, it's available directly from CRI. Uh, here, let me paste this into the chat box. Uh, let's see, here's the chat box. There you go. Uh, 
And it's seven tips. Pick a leader, as Craig's already talked about. Create culture. We're talking about it now. This third point, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, Craig, if you want to make a few comments on that, uh, how important the communication side is. Sure, sure. So, and it goes beyond training. You know, the, the idea of annual training um, is one thing that's important. But beyond that, short, frequent communications are really the key to trying to build mind share and have people be able to remember this. Yeah, there was a Harvard Business Review study, uh, God, this goes back 20, 20 plus years, why change management programs fail. Uh, and in some ways, what we're talking about, I think Craig with, with cybersecurity is change management to, in that sense. Uh, and the one of the lead reasons for failure uh, was a failure to communicate often enough. It's like you got to say it over and over and over again. Uh, tip four, protect the crown jewels. We'll talk more about that later. Tip five, have a plan. We'll talk about that later. Uh, understand the basics, be compliant, choose third parties carefully. And, and we're, we're talking about all of these things now. And um, again, just an, an illustration of the kind of quality, Craig, that you've been able to pull together uh, I'm in this group uh, with good God, people from all over the world, and it's 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 truly wonderful. Maybe you want to talk about the extent of that group. Sure. So we do have people from uh, Australia in it. We have some of the uh, ISACs involved, the auto ISAC and the uh, uh, oil and gas ISAC. Um, we have. Um, it's really been a great. We have people from Europe also, mm -hmm. so it's been really useful because the challenges that small and mid-sized enterprises face are really consistent globally. And uh, for, for us to be able to collect information globally, it really helps to uh, look at the commonality of the challenges that companies face. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'm gonna stop sharing and please pick it up again. Sure, so <clears throat> here we go. So. What we do at CRI and what we would recommend all of you to think about is starting with what we call the four core issues or the core four. And <clears throat> we pick these based on research, um, based on input that we got from Microsoft in particular, um, based on all the research that they have done. So if we think about these across these four, passwords and authentication, right? So many data breaches start there. I'm going to show you on the next slide a really interesting stat about passwords and how length of password is probably one of the best ways to secure yourself. Multi-factor authentication. If you have to pick one thing to do related to passwords and, and access control, longer passwords, use multi-factor authentication. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that... I find that both theoretically important. I mean, your number of 80% and, and Microsoft has come out with numbers and, and so have others. Uh, but also looking at the pain of failure. Um, we have a client that uh, shortly after we started working with them, we said, you know, you have got to start implementing two-factor authentication. And the, they were a law firm. They are a law firm. So uh, we've talked earlier about law firm challenges, uh, breaches and all. Um, and the partner said, no, we don't want to be bothered with having to enter in that second factor. I acknowledge, you know, here's my phone. I log into wherever it is I'm going. I've got to uh, either pull in the Microsoft Authenticator, Google's Authenticator, get a text message, however it works. You know, it, it does take a few more steps. Uh, and they just, nope, we're not going to do it. We don't care about it. Well, sure enough, their email got breached. And that resulted in a $40,000 business email compromise loss that wow. could clearly have been prevented with multi-factor authentication. Wow. Yeah, that's a great example. And the other thing that I like to do with, uh, if you're communicating to others in your organization or clients is to come up with a few key stats that are kind of like good, what I call cocktail party stats. Mm -hmm. So the 17% of people using their favorite sports team in the current year is their password 
is really an interesting stat. So if you think about like Dodgers 2020, that means statistically, if I'm a hacker and I wanna target a company, whatever, JPL out in Pasadena or something like that. And if I just start to go through, I, it's easy to know their email naming convention. And if I just start to go through and run through passwords, statistically, I will find somebody at that company that had Dodgers 2020 as their password. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, mean, I remember when I started in this industry and this goes back 40 years now, I was at the MITRE Corporation uh, and the, we were, I mean, the, the whole industry was just getting started at the time. And one of our people went off to an Air Force base somewhere in the South. I don't remember where it was. Um, and part of what he was there for was to test how easy he could break into their systems. Uh, I was, you know, uh, he, so he comes back and, okay, you know, how easy or how hard was it? He says, it was a piece of cake. We took a dictionary and now again, go back 40 years. So there's not everything online that there is today, but they took a basic dictionary, half a million words, put it in, put, just put the words in a file and match the file, shot the file into the password encryptor and see what the matches were. And uh -huh. they came back with, you know, they broke into everything. <laughs> it's a piece of cake. And that's 40 years ago, Craig, you know, and people are still doing this, this basic stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, software updates, of course, are an issue here. And, and one of the things with software updates now with the uh, hybrid workplace and people working remote and office and all that that happened in response to the pandemic, what we often see, and you, you hit on this before, Stan, is that I might have a work issued laptop, but because I'm working from home a lot, I might sometimes be logging in from my personal desktop. And so maybe IT or IT people or are updating my laptop, the software on my company as should, but maybe I'm really lousy about updating the software on my personal device, but I'm still using it to connect. Yeah. You and that's, that, think now about what devices are people using because it's quite often it's more of a blur between company issued and personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and we we also see that. I mean, and one of the challenges that COVID has brought on, uh, particularly in the initial lockdown period last spring, uh, we have a colleague out here who went to order ninety laptops for her people so they could work remotely. Uh, and was given it was going to be a three month delay in getting those laptops. So you got to keep the business running. Now you've got to use home computers. You're really in a challenging security situation that way. Very much so. And then the other thing that we see, and I, I still see this happening, is that um, because of the the uh, really common use of video uh, video meetings. Some companies went with Zoom, some with WebEx, some with Teams, whatever it is. And I've been on many situations where I'm on a call with an executive from a company and I'll be on a Zoom call with them and we'll be chatting and they'll say, well, our company blocks Zoom. And I'll say, so how did you get on this call? And they said, well, I'm actually using my home computer to access this call because it's on Zoom. And I'll say, hey, you know, while you're doing that, do you ever check your company email while you're on a, like if you're on an hour long Zoom call using your personal computer, are you ever checking your company email? And they say quite often, they'll say, yeah, all the time. So here's a case again, where it's not bad intent, but they're just ending up using a personal device to connect with company, uh, the company systems. Mm -hmm. So the phishing, I think we're, we're all pretty familiar with phishing. Um, it's gotten worse. There's been a lot of phishing related to uh, COVID specifically, um, especially in the beginning stages of it. Very sophisticated attempts uh, to try to fool people into clicking things related to COVID. Yeah. Um, and here again, you know, what we see is you need to train people, but then you want to keep it current. And it's the kind of thing you want to keep in mind with them, because if, if you're Put yourself in, 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 in somebody's shoes where they're at home, uh, their husband or wife or uh, partner is working from home and they got three kids trying to do remote schooling yeah. and things are like crazy. And, you know, the kids are interrupting, asking for different things. Um, 
and they're clicking on an email that they think is from their boss. You know, and we've seen the other thing that we've seen related to phishing is now that more companies are going to um, cloud based file storage. We have seen situations where somebody will hijack an email account, set up a fake link to the company's cloud based file storage and send it to somebody saying, I need you to work on this document, click on this link. And boom, you click on it and that's the gateway for them. Right. Yeah, and this is one of those questions, one of those challenges that, that I see. Uh, I mean, we, we do phishing attacks. Uh, again, I'm putting the Secure the Village hat off and putting my Miller Kaplan Director of Information Security on uh, hat on. So we'll do phishing attacks. Uh, and there's you know lots of other organizations that do the same. Uh, and there was a story not too long ago, it was at the, the holiday season of uh, a company that did a phishing attack on their people right around the holidays that talked about, you know, a free bonus or something like that. And it was a, a phishing attack and, and people got very, very upset. The, the recipients of that email, you know, hey, we're rushing, we're crazy, it's Christmas time, why are you testing us here? And you know, uh, the other side of it is, if you're really gonna do a realistic test, it should be a realistic test. You should do it at the most challenging time. I mean, our managing director has said, you know, go April, you know, we're a CPA firm. So April 14th, do a phishing attack, do a right. phishing test. We don't care. It's more important that our people get practice in regularly paying attention to an email comes in, is it legit or is it not legit? And there again, it goes so much to leadership where uh, better in advance, tell your people, hey, we're going to fish you any time of the year, 24 by 7 by 365. You've always got to be careful uh, so that when that phishing attack comes in at the wrong time, people are already prepped. They're not going to be upset that they've been tested then. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, that, that's a piece that, that we see here. Yeah, absolutely. I think we just got a question in from uh, Diane. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of phishing emails from DocuSign, Adobe, et cetera. Di Diane's a, a recruiter. Uh, yeah, and she's in the business of getting attachments is, is Diane's challenge as a recruiter. And like, how do you, how do you manage this? Uh, particularly for people who you know, don't have the, wisdom, the benefit of, of our wisdom, if you will. Yeah, no, that that's a challenge. And, and uh, a couple things. So one is, I, I think you should set up pretty rigorous requirements for people that submit things to you. So you mentioned here about nothing in the subject line, things like that, you should have some kind of requirements that people go through. And the other thing, unfortunately, is we would recommend that you contact them through an alternative channel to verify. Now you as a recruiter, you're gonna to have to of course weigh the, you know, how much effort you wanna put into it. But um, that really is the best way. If it's somebody asking you to send money or change your password or give you their social, give them your social security number, you should always try to contact them through an alternative channel. Yeah, that always, if you can. Um, the other thing with, with, with phishing as well is on the defensive side on the other end, uh, to the extent, and we'll mention patching and, and all as we go, but uh, I think we already have touched on it, but to the extent that you keep your systems patched and updated, the phishing attack may not succeed um, you know, because you'll have you know, the, the exploit in the fish uh, won't run. So that can be of help as well. And then the, the other one is USBs. And I already told a, a little story about that. We do see people are using USBs much less. Mm -hmm. um, and if, particularly now with the, uh, with the remote work and the hybrid workplace, we see more people going to cloud-based files sharing, um, which is, is certainly a good a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, of course it does at the same time, just push the challenge. Now you've got to configure your cloud environment securely. And that too becomes the, the next challenge. 
So here's the stat that I wanted to share with you all around passwords. And if there's one action that you take or you get your company to take, um, just have them create longer passwords. It's the number one thing that you could do just immediately. Uh, the only barrier to doing it is your willingness to do it. Um, and so here's the stat. So if somebody's putting real horsepower, hackers are putting real horsepower against cracking passwords, if you have eight characters, regardless of special characters, numbers, letters, they can hack it in three minutes, three minutes. If you go to 12 characters, it's up to 83 years. You add a 13th character, it's 5.2 million years. So why would anybody have a password less than 13? We actually recommend 15, which may be a little excessive, yeah. but we, we recommend 15 character passwords. The other thing that the, the great thing about longer passwords is that you don't have to change them. So one of the most annoying things to me, and one of the things that we see as a big problem in a lot of companies is when um, passwords are set to routinely expire. And so what does that lead to? It leads to people using easy to remember passwords, to making very minor modifications on their password, to writing them down. I still go into places where people have their passwords on post-its on their, on their monitors. You know, not as much as 10 years ago, but it still happens. So mm -hmm. the number one thing I would all ask you to do is to create longer passwords. Yeah, yeah, that, that again, such a good, good sound and simple advice. I mean, this is not one of those things. I mean, we want multi-factor authentication used, but you got to, you got to get that set up, right? That takes, you know, you can't just, right. there it's done. Uh, changing passwords to long pass phrases, Right. 13, 15 characters. Our standard also is, is 15. Uh, if you've got your password management system that has all your passwords, that's the keys to the kingdom. Uh, that, you know, make that 20 characters even. So it's even harder to crack. One of the people, so you're saying that if you have a 15 character password, you think the companies who ask you to change every three months will no longer require the changes. I think that's a transition we're making, don't you, Craig? I do. And also, Diane, in many cases, you have control over when you want passwords to expire. So if you have an, in your company, if you have an IT person or if you're using an IT consultant, they often can control that, the, uh, the expiration timing on passwords. We had one, our company actually used to, we had to do it every three months. Um, and and it, it, it's just ridiculous. You know, inevitably I would be getting off a plane and my password would have expired. And I'm like on my way to give a presentation someplace. Um, so you should yeah. check in, but you should have control over that. It's not typically set by the software company itself. Yeah. Stan, is that your experience also? Yeah, uh, same, same kind of thing. Uh, easy to change. And there's new, and it's not yet on the Secure the Village website. Uh, we're looking for right now, as we speak, looking for the right link to it. But NIST has changed their guidance on passwords. Uh, and uh, we've not published the, the, the long complicated document because we think that perhaps is too much for Secure the Village. Uh, but uh, the idea is, you know, a long password multi-factor authentication, you, as you said earlier, you only need to change that if that has been breached. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing, just while we're on the topic of passwords, thematically, you should have a different theme that you use for business and for personal. Yeah. So if you're using like a recipe, like some kind of recipe for your business, um, you should, and you want to use like your favorite ski runs for your, for your personal. Those are the kind of things you do, but you don't want to mix the two of them up as the other piece of advice. That's right. Yeah, we, we recommend every password, at least every password be different, at least every password for sensitive accounts, your bank accounts, your business accounts, and so on. Keep all of those separate passwords for separate things. Absolutely. Yeah. So what we talk about with small companies is 
taking a risk-based approach. Yeah. And this is really, it's really a good practical way to start. So if you think about prioritizing what systems and data is most important for you to protect. So that's where you would start is think about it. And on the next slide, um, Stan and I are gonna actually talk through some different ways to think about it. But so that's the first start is to prioritize what would you wanna protect? Then what are the most likely ways that it would get lost or damaged, right? So, and that really depends on what you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. Then to think through what would cause the worst damage? And think about it from a data loss, like if you could no longer use this data, what would happen? Or that it was publicly released. I mean, Sony Pictures had a, a situation 10 or so years ago where it was public release of data that was really damning to them. Also think about damage from business continuity or your systems being down. And then also, again, financial damage or reputational damage. And they all vary from industry to industry. They really do. So Stan, anything on you want to comment here? And then I know we're going to chat a bit about the next the next. Yeah. Slide. No, I I think you're you're right on. And and this reflects in some sense a, a real shift over the last couple of years, not so much in security, but in how security is being described, this risk-based approach. I mean, we looked 40 years ago, you know, it, it was clear one had to look, you know, what's the most important thing to protect when you're talking about, you got to make sure nuclear missiles don't go off by accident, but they do go off if we need them to go off. Because that was one of the early projects that I got to work on, you know, and we were really focused on, okay, what's the most important thing here? Yeah, you know, uh -huh. which are those two things, the third being keep the, keep, keep the security codes private, you know, secure, uh -huh. uh, you know, and if other things didn't work right, well, that was, that was an error, that was a quality problem, but that wasn't going to significantly impact life and safety and so on. So in those cases, it's rather easy to prioritize getting everybody in a room sitting around, you know, the HR director, the CFO, the president, the head of sales and marketing and uh, operations and so on. And having that discussion around prioritization is a really interesting exercise for a company because they've typically not thought about it before this way. And there's a lot of insight you get from having that discussion across the organization. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you bring up the the... Uh, the idea of the cross-functional collaboration is, is so critical and it's a great point because different people will have different perspectives from their department. Yeah. And for all of you, if, if you were going to sit with your company and go through this, um, going back to my theme of demystification, one of the ways that I get people to start the discussion is to think about it in the context of jewelry. So if you have really valuable jewelry that your grandmother gave you that is both has high monetary value and very high sentimental value, you probably take some steps to protect it. You know, it's, it might be in a safe, it might be hidden, it might be in a safety, uh, uh, safety deposit box, but you're taking some steps to protect it. On the other hand, if you have a 14 year old daughter that likes to wear costume jewelry and she has, there could be a bowl of earrings, like my daughter when she was that age, there was a bowl of earrings by the door going outside the house. And so there would be like, you know, eight or 10 different pairs of earrings there that were all worth like whatever, eight or 10 or 12 bucks each. And mm -hmm. she would just grab a pair based on what she wanted. That was a fine level of protection for that type of jewelry. But you would yep. never leave your grandmother's heirlooms in a bowl by the door. So it's the same thing with thinking about your systems and data. Yeah, well said. That's a nice analogy. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is uh, this is kind of what Stan and I now wanted to talk to you about a bit. Is a lot of companies kind of have, in my opinion, they have kind of a vague idea of what would happen if there was a cyber breach. And what what we want you to think about is the issue of data loss versus business continuity. And a breach can really have caused both. You could lose the data or you could be shut. 
has a different way of, of a different level of importance to the two. And so um, the example I'll give you here is if you're a law firm, data loss is absolutely can be critical to you. Um, if confidential information from your clients got out and leaked, it hurts your reputation. It can really damage your firm in a, in a huge way. It could lead to lawsuits, a host of things. Whereas if you're a law firm and your website goes down for even a week, it's not that big a deal, right? You're just not getting that much business over your website. If you're a retailer or a restaurant now that's doing like takeout and curbside delivery and your website goes down for a week, you've lost a lot of money. So what I want all of you to think about either for your company or for your uh, clients is to think about these two things. What would happen if we couldn't get the data or it went public? And what would happen if part of our systems went down? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, and, and again, what you're saying, the, the, the key thing is just pay attention to both of these. It's not an either or. It's, uh, you know, you, you've got to be prepared for both. Uh, and different organizations are going to have different um, reactions, if you will, to the loss. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, there are companies that really don't have trade secrets to speak of. So fine, that's okay. There's nothing there. Uh, most companies will have confidential customer information, if nothing more than sales information and pricing information and, and, and things like that. Uh, almost all companies will have confidential employee information uh, that has to be protected there that uh, many will have personally identifiable information of their customers those that don't will still have their own internal personally identifiable information so this chart the left hand side of it i see is a really nice beginning for the discussion of okay where are the crown jewels and then the second part is the on the right hand side the business continuity is okay what can get in the way of our ability to deliver services? So as you mentioned, the website, I, you know, you, you take our, you know, Miller Kaplan's website just as an example. If it did go down, you know, all right, we'd work to get it back up. If we couldn't do um, email and communication, that could impact our business because now we can't communicate with each other, and particularly working from home, we have to communicate with each other. So. On the business continuity side, there's also that relativism. If some things are more important than others, let's have that leadership discussion, I think you're saying, Craig, so that we truly understand what matters and what doesn't. Absolutely. And, and this also is where, depending on the size of your organization, you do want to pull in the different department heads too, um, to be able to get their input on it, because people will, may have very, very different views of what the most important information is mm -hmm. or what's the most important system. Yeah. Um, and this also helps to facilitate a common understanding. Um, so I'll give you one quick story is working with a, a mid-sized company um, that had a lot of trade secrets. In addition to the other things, they had a lot of trade secrets. And we went in and we first were talking to the legal department and we were talking about um, uh, the levels of confidentiality and how they classified information. And they said, well, we have four levels of, of information classification. So then we went to the IT department and I said to them, so how many levels are your access control set up on? And they said, well, we have three levels of access control. And I said, well, do you know legal actually has four levels of of classification. And they said, really? So then we went out to the business units that were actually running either on the supply side or the sales side. And we said, okay, functionally, how many levels of data classification do you work with? And they said two. So they either dealt with it as confidential or not. IT had set it up at three levels and legal actually had four levels of data classification and marking. So there was a huge mismatch because those departments had never really talked to each other. 
Yeah, no, that that's that's a, a, a it's a great example, Craig. It it, it reminds me of uh, twenty years ago. I, this was the the first assessment I did I had done in the small medium sized business space after you know coming out of aerospace and and so on. So I, I I went to the IT department and I said, so what do you do when somebody leaves the company to make sure they're out of the network? And they gave me what was a reasonable answer. I went to the HR people and I said, what do you do when somebody leaves the company and we want to make sure they're out of the system? And they gave me a perfectly reasonable answer. The problem was I had two answers, different <laughs> answers. They didn't connect. And right. it's, it's the silo problem, like all over again. Absolutely. And, and you know, the other thing that um, I think for all of you to think about is around incident response. So, you know, at, at Cyber Readiness Institute, we think about how do you deal with those core four issues to become preventative? And then we also have tools in there to help you build a simple incident response plan. And incident response is really an interesting area because preparation is so important to how you respond to the incident. And whether it's ransomware, we talked about that a bit before, or another type of cyber attack, if you're well prepared for it, it's annoying, but not devastating. Mm -hmm. If you're not prepared for it, it can be absolutely devastating. And some of the stats that we see or that um, Stan, uh, have you verify this one, it's like 40% of small businesses go out of business within a year after a serious cyber attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen statistics like that. I've seen the number as high as 60%. Uh, uh -huh. I've I also frankly think that we really don't know because we just we don't do a good job yet of collecting statistics in this space. But just, you know, if, let, let's just hypothesize that that 40 percent is off by double 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Let's say the number is only only 20 percent. That's still devastating. Right. You know, so at 40 percent, it's even worse. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to. The, the statistics don't have to be absolutely accurate to still tell a story that says, good God, you want to be ready for when this happens, not if, but when, again. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a key. And then, you know, now with, with the, uh, the pandemic, we, we wrote a lot of guides on, on hybrid workplace and remote work. In the beginning, we were writing about remote work and, and what companies had to do to rapidly switch to remote work. And then we started to think more about the hybrid workplace, which really does look like it's going to be here to stay quite a bit. A lot of companies that we talk to are going to uh, continue having people work from home or come into the office on a far less frequent basis than they used to. Mm -hmm. So this kind of hybrid approach, um, there when we what what we would advocate all of you think about is devices connections and data. So what devices are being used to connect? How are people connecting? And then what data is being accessed and shared? Mm -hmm. and if you look at those three things, it kind of gives you a way to break down where to, where to focus your effort. Stan, how does, what are those, what do you think about the hybrid workplace? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's here to stay, uh, you know, where we'll begin to go back into offices in part, but I think we're all finding there's an efficiency to working at home, if you will. Uh, you don't have to get in your car and drive anywhere and you avoid all of that. Uh, also, the cost of the business goes down if they can have to rent or lease less office space you know so that, that you know this can drive down costs. It raises up the, the security challenges. That, that people will have. So it's, yeah, uh, nothing goes without payment. You know, what's the Spanish proverb? Take what you want, God said, but pay for it. You know, so there's pros and cons to all of these things. But I, I think the reality is, you know, we're in this hybrid environment for forever. And here, here's another simple tip for the people that you, you have that may be working at home is, um, one is to see if they have or encourage them to change their home router password. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, if you're in a city environment, and again, if hackers wanted to, they could be outside a, a building in New York City. And you know how when you, you're 
in, in a crowded place, you can see there's like, you know, hundred, hundreds of, of Wi-Fi networks that you can log into, right? So they know that most people never change the default passwords on their home routers. So if you haven't changed it, then they have a way to, to skim over and start to use default passwords, depending on what type of router you have, mm -hmm. and eventually be able to, you know, crack into networks that way. Yeah. Yeah, that to me, that's an argument that, that first the business has need needs to be thinking about uh, behind between the router and the the PC. Put a real industrial strength firewall mm -hmm. so that you've got that protection, and IT should manage that. Uh, and the other, with or without that firewall, uh, everything traversing through that v, through that router, which I have to assume is insecure, uh, should be encrypted. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's those, the are really, those are key things. And, you know, we had one, yeah. uh, one person was suggesting that each person would set up a, a uh, segregated network at home. And I said to them, okay, so how many of your employees, they had a couple hundred employees, how many of your employees are capable of setting up a segregated network on their home, yeah. on their home Wi-Fi? And mm -hmm. this is probably zero, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Able to do that. So either you have to do it for them, or you have some kind of town hall meeting and you walk them all through it at one time, but you can't just push out the idea to tell people to do it and not be able to tell them how to do it. That, that again gets back to that idea of culture and behavior. You then just create a workaround culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another interesting thing that y'all can do is, we do this sometimes is you ask the people that run your cyber program like give them three or four questions on how well they think things are going. And then you ask the employees the same questions. And it's really interesting to get the information back and look at the, the kind of the difference of opinions. Yeah. Uh, I, and again, it, 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 it's, the, it's the silos uh, when, when you get different answers here, you know, and, and even as I say it, I mean, some of it's reasonable, like reasonable. Uh, I should not have to know how to configure my firewall. Right. Right. That's a reasonable place for the IT to folks right. to come in. Right. right. Uh, but I should know, or management should tell me, hey, we're putting a, pa a firewall in. Here's how you need to manage it. We'll give right. you an hour's worth of training or whatever. So we make sure you can do your part of it. Uh, but we got to get it done. It's, it's again, it's, it's that leadership piece, Greg. Absolutely. So um, we just have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know if we, we've been uh, yeah. chatting away and I'm right. trust that you all have been putting in questions as you had any. Yeah, I don't see any future ones uh, that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, got a couple of comments on all here uh, as one person had to leave because just we're, we're up against the, uh, top of the hour again. Um, let, why don't we wrap it up and give me uh, back the screen and I'll just, you know, give the, the standard secure the village end of webinar boilerplate, so to speak. There you uh, go. Back to you, Stan. For, for where we're at. Uh, you know, th this is part of, of several uh, ongoing uh, groups that we have going the the this is the information security management webinar we also have a, a workforce working group if you're in the workforce space uh you you know there's a great disconnect between supply and demand we need far more cybersecurity people than uh we have and so we've got a group that meets uh once a month uh to work through this to, to be a, a player in in doing it better uh the National Institute of, of uh, I'm sorry, the National Initiative of Cybersecurity Education, uh, which is part of NIST, uh, they're hosting a, a webinar um, on the cybersecurity career on February 17th. Our monthly financial services cybersecurity roundtable uh, is going to be all about money laundering and COVID fraud cases. That's Friday morning, uh, the 19th. Uh, next week, we have our technology and security management happy hour coming up on the 23rd. And there we're going to be looking at uh, a new technology. Uh, these people, Josh Aaron, uh, is going to talk about um, for main, uh, configuring and maintaining 
the IT devices on an IT network. That's that's our our most technical uh, um, uh, event, if you will. And then we're back here in a month uh, with Barry Weber, who's uh, uh, an information security management consultant, also like me, a University of Michigan graduate. So uh, there's there's that piece as as well that Barry and I have in common. We'll be back here on March 11th at 10 o'clock. Um, one of the things I invite everybody to do is just uh, get on the Secure the Village website, sign up for our weekly newsletter. Uh, it's about 25 to 30 stories, headlines with links to what's going on in the world of, of cybersecurity, along with our weekend patch report. And that's become more important than ever as people are working from home. So that keep your computers patched uh, and updated. Uh, here's our new village website, uh, Secure the Village website. Take a look at it. We're really proud of, of everything on it. Uh, this webinar that we're doing right now, uh, that will be available probably by Monday on the uh, Secure the Village website. So you can get that in the Learn button, which is the link to our library. Uh, one of our board members, Steve Krantz, has written a book, Cyber Guardian, a Secure the Village Guide for Residents. Uh, and there's a whole host of things that we you can, you can do. Just join us, uh, be a part of us. If you're not involved directly in cybersecurity, Here's a place to come learn. If you are involved in uh, cybersecurity, join our Village Square, be a cyber leader, uh, contribute your materials as well, with again the idea that it takes the village to secure the village. Um, I can't let it go without uh, a, a shout out for my book, The Agnostic Patriot, having nothing to do with cybersecurity, um, but it does have to do with who we are as a nation and what we're about. Uh, the agnostic in it is that um, I take one axiom that we are all created equal from the Declaration of Independence. And in a series of essays that I wrote over what is about close to 20 years, uh, kind of explored that theme as it evolved. So uh, that's where we are. Here's uh, contact information. You can reach me uh, at stand at securethevillage.org and Craig at CMOS at cyberreadinessinstitute.org. Uh, with that, uh, Craig, any final words? No, it's been a pleasure and uh, always uh, would look forward to doing it again with you, Stan. Super. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, totally grateful for uh, your participation and, and not just your participation here, but the work you and Marion and all the people at the Cyber Readiness Institute are doing to help make this a more cyber secure world. So thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. Great. Bye-bye.